Welcome everybody, and we're back again for another fun-filled Sunday roast. Today, we are privileged to have sensational guests, Femi and Marina, as well as my excellent co-host, Max. <laughs> Femi, would you like to kick us all off with some info about yourself? Hi, I'm Femi Olawale. I'm a former anti-Brexit campaigner, well, current anti campaigner, anti-Tory campaigner and political commentator. And I Marina. am Marina Perkis, and I am a, I'm not, I'm, this isn't my main gig. My main gig is I'm a, U, a US uh, tech marketing lead, but this has sort of taken over. So I'm now this political commentator. And, and then Max. Max here, uh, I run a YouTube channel. I talk about Brexit and British politics and my bugbear is corruption and getting it out of politics. Alex, uh, tell so us a bit about yourself too. Uh, my name's Alex, I'm a historian, I'm an author, and I got into politics because of all the corruption in the government as well. So we've got, we've got that in common. Marina, can mm -hmm. you tell us what it was that suddenly spurred you into all of this? Basically what? the same as you guys. It was you guys, it was, it was all the corruption and dodginess, but it was triggered by 2016 Brexit referendum. I was pretty much like, non-political I couldn't have told you who the leader of no I probably could have told you that but I really didn't know much about politics or, or anything about it until I started falling down the rabbit holes because I couldn't quite understand how the hell we had ended up voting out and all the lies and stuff that we were fed and yeah I just basically fell down rabbit hole after rabbit hole and I am still falling <laughs> Just, it does. It just goes on forever, isn't it? It is literally like a black hole. So Brexit Sorry, isn't no. isn't done. Brexit isn't done. No. <laughs> depends who you talk to. <laughs> it depends on the day of the week. Uh, it depends on the Tory candidate, which is again a nice segue. <laughs> Femi, um, please, how did you get into all of this? So I was working in Brussels in 2014-15 ish, uh, and I was working for an NGO that focused on the human rights abuses in the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain. I was working alongside British members of the European Parliament, pushing back against the policies of the UK to sell weapons to Saudi Arabia, which were being used to bomb hospitals and schools in Yemen, training Bahraini police who would then arrest and torture human rights defenders. And so I was already involved in what I thought was a battle for the soul of the UK, are we the good guys or not, in 2015-16. And that's before I'd heard of the word Brexit. So when I saw the word Brexit start to come onto the stage, um, I thought, wait, hang on, could things actually get worse? And I thought, and I, then I looked at the conversation that was happening over Brexit uh, with uh, Nigel Farage types telling people that the EU is a dictatorship. Meanwhile, I'm there in Brussels working alongside the directly elected members of the European Parliament. It's pretty easy to see that something was going wrong and neither Cameron or Corbyn was able to counter the narrative. So I just started making little videos and it just sort of snowballed from there. It is funny how the word dictatorship is still synonymous with the EU. I tend to find with a lot of students, they call it a dictatorship. And it's obviously, they've heard it from parents and then regurgitated it out into the classroom. And you're like, how have you all been brainwashed to think it's some form of dictatorship? Do you, yeah. do you get much of this, Marina? Like, do you get the word dictatorship and the EU being thrown around? Um, on Twitter, I, I mean, there's some people that are still defending Brexit, even though they're they're starting to... I think a lot of Brexiters are starting to see that it's, it's a complete failure of a policy. But that, so that's the thing they hold on to. They, they, are, they hold on to the fact that it's this sovereignty, this freedom from this dictatorship. And that's obviously the stuff that's been forced down their throats like a wild bra goose from the daily mail basically can i ask a question of both, both of you because both, both something i'd love to do is i'd love to actually speak to a brexit here and both of you had the if you want to call it a privilege you've both sat on in <laughs> studios where you've spoken to brexiteers two things is it do you believe like do you believe that they actually believe what they're saying or is it just a grift and second how do you keep saying when when you're listening to people just regurgitating Daily Express or Daily Mail, sorry, The Express or Daily Mail headlines. Marina, do you want to go first? So I was recently on a podcast. I won't name the person or the podcast, but I was recently on a podcast with someone who was still believing. The first thing when I said to him, like, you know, what is it about Brexit that, you know, you, know, you love so much? What's the benefit for you? And he said the vaccine rollout. And this, this is a trigger for me. So I basically just explained why and gave all of the reasons why that wasn't the case, which I won't go into now, because I'm sure you guys know and our audience knows. Um, and then he just, it, it all it went from that straight to sentiment. He, he was talking about how in, he wakes up in the morning and he feels better that we're free from the EU, from the fact that they were talking about an army, for example. Basically, their argument is rooted in 
nothing now. And I think you've got the people like that who are, it's a bit like, have you ever spoken to, have you ever spoken to like, it's like me talking to a pal and, you know, her husband's been cheating on her and she's just in complete denial and wants to believe that actually he's not, or if he has, it's, it's, it's gone off and it's going to be fine. That's, that's, it's that sort of like, I mean, that's that sort of mentality. They've stuck to it for so long now. It's become their identity. They cannot, they cannot go, God, everything I've trusted, everything I've believed, everything I've thought was total. The swear word. First one. That's First okay. One. That's that's a that's Won't a be the last. <laughs> <laughs> um, Femi, what were your? What, how have you found it? So you've got to split it between two. There's the people who take center stage and go and praise Brexit on Twitter, on Twitter, on on the, on the media, radio, TV, etc. And then there's your average um, person on the streets and how how they are. And so. If you voted leave in 2016, I, I, I honestly don't hold it against you, depending on what you did afterwards. Because watching three years of chaos before that 2019 election and still supporting Brexit is very different to supporting Brexit after three months of the worst political campaign we've ever seen. Um, so, I, and given that most people did not understand that the single market was in 2016 or the customs union or any of that sort of stuff, if you're just going on, oh, which politicians do I trust? You've got one side um, offering basically status quo, and that's David Cameron, the same person who's put you and your family through six years of austerity. On the other, on the other side, you've got Boris Johnson saying the North has been screwed. The system doesn't work for you, which all stuff which is true, uh, but just aiming your anger in the direction of the EU I get it. As for whether or not they believe it, uh, I mean, go going around the country during those years after the referendum, uh, when we were um, pushing for a second referendum, the best thing about that was seeing how normal people actually handle this topic. Because you could have rational conversations with them. You could say, um, why did you vote Brexit? Oh, I want more, more control. Well, the Brexit Theresa May is offering you basically means we copy the rules of the EU, but without any say. How do you think about that? Well, that's absolute bollocks. Um, what, do you, what do you want? Well, we need to find some way of avoiding that. Well, it's either no deal. No, I didn't. I didn't vote for no deal. Um, uh, all right, then what are your options? Well, I guess we could. I don't, I don't know. How do you think about a second referendum? Yeah, but if we do or go out, then we then we go out out, and stuff like that. They can have rational conversations. Unfortunately, the sort of people we end up dealing with on the radio, on the on the TV, they are in it. They they know the score. You can't be doing this twenty four seven as your day job and not know just how damaging what you've inflicted on the country is. So those people know exactly what they've done. They're just pivoting around the truth. When when it comes to you, Max, the, I, it's interesting you bring that up for me, and I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna come back so as a follow up question to both of you to to bring that up because it's it's obvious to us. It should be obvious to them. What have you actually found anyone, Max, that can involve you? Uh, we'll discuss with you about Brexit. Who's been a Brexiteer? Have you actually contacted anyone? Or I, I have. I have been contacting people. I have been trying to reach out to a number of different people, and they've either pulled back, pulled out at the last moment, or will find excuses for not not debating. So it's either yeah, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it, and then there's a problem at the last minute, or they'll say, uh, well, well, I'll do it uh, by email, or I'll do it by Twitter, or I'll do it. Yeah, but that's not. It's not a great way to debate something. And for me, it's not even just about, it's not even really about debating. I just want to know why somebody voted against their own interests. And if I'm wrong, please educate me on that. But it's really, really difficult. And I'm not interested really in talking with people who are trying to sell Brexit because for them it's economically beneficial. You know, the the talk radio people or whatever like that. Because I, I don't actually believe that they, as Femi has said, that they, they know the, the real situation but it's maybe in a sense it's beneficial for them to continue to sell this um i'm interested in you know somebody who really does believe that brexit is a, is a good idea and, and it has succeeded but then maybe those people really don't exist like jacob rees mogg you know he was reaching out to the sun asking them asking member readers of the sun to give him information to give him uh, examples of how Brexit is succeeding. He's the guy who sold it to them. It's like, you know, you buy a used car from somebody and then the used car salesman asks you, tell me what's good about this car. No, no, you, that's your job. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, if there's somebody watching this now, even just to have a conversation, it doesn't have to be a debate. We don't have to argue, but just 
for me to understand why somebody voted this way and why they still continue to think it's a good idea. Max, it's a very difficult conversation for some people to have. It's uncomfortable for them because unfortunately it will push them into a position where they have to make, uh, they have to realize uncomfortable truths. Um, like like the, way, the way I would approach it is I, you know, I support the European Union. I'm a fan of the European Union, but it's not perfect. And we can mm. agree on why, you know, why there are problems within the European Union. I'm, I'm not going to start off from the position the European Union is perfect um, because it's not. And I think we can we can start off on where we agree and then we can try to understand where we disagree. And maybe I will learn something and they will learn something. But maybe I'm <laughs> uh, I'm grasping at straws here. It does seem as if there is a logic that they refuse to take on board. I haven't had the privilege like you guys have had of dealing with people like this. But I have had the privilege of dealing with my dad and that generation and talking about it and listening to him. And they can see the faults. They're aware of it, but that's not what they care about. Uh, at least that's the impression. Obviously, what, it's more what do they care about, Alex? They care about the premise of sovereignty, nationalism, and the reduction of immigration. The topic that I hear a lot of, and I've been hearing about this for years. Like, so I used to work as a football coach. And I've worked over a large ch chunk of the UK, including in London. And the thing that you seem to hear a lot of people complaining about, which was very much, as soon as you heard the complaint, you knew there were Brexit voters. You heard, oh, my community's being taken over by foreigners. That was the that was the big one that seemed to come through over and over again. And they felt that their identity associated with their area and who they grew up with, and obviously their identity as English people, was being eroded. They couldn't see that there was integration, and they felt that the facilities that should be available to them weren't. And that was the that was the. As soon as you heard that, that meant straight away that I know exactly where you voted when it came to that election. The um, thing is, I think we, we had the problem as well. We had we had a conflation of issues. We had a conflation of immigration from the EU with migrants arriving in boats across the channel. And yeah. what, what we've ended up doing is actually weakening our position on both fronts because actually our migrant boat crossings are at record numbers now because we don't have the Dublin agreement, which actually did allow us to send people back. Um, and then we've got the problem, which is people have gone, oh, but we didn't mind those EU Im immigrants, the ones that were doing the jobs that now we're desperate for and they have crippled our hospitality, agriculture, horticulture, et cetera, industries for. And it was just, it just shows how it was such, it was a it was a campaign that just preyed on ignorance and confusion and lies. But it was like and, before, and that, before 20, oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. Femi, go ahead. I was gonna say that, that that conflation exists right to literally today with Stuella Braverman saying that uh, elect me as prime minister because I need to fulfill the, uh, fulfill the promises of Brexit by stopping the migrant boats. I know, she actually was even more reductive. She said in her campaign video, Vote for me because I am the only one who will stop my boats because I will leave EH, uh, ECHR, the Human, yeah. European Convention on Human Rights. The, 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 the leap you have to make to get there, as if that is going to solve the problem. One, it would never, it, it can't, I just don't think it's going to happen. I think there'd be so many obstacles to prevent that happening. I, I'm, I'm hoping maybe I'm too optimistic. But also, as if that's going to happen, even if we do, even if that means then we can go ahead and we can put people on flights to Rwanda, that is not going to act as a deterrent. It's just not. No. They're, they're absolutely mad. Part of their policy was to spend about, I think it was 1.7 million was spent sending out text messages to people to warn them not to come to the UK because they'll be sent to Rwanda. And it's like, how do you know it's going to the right? I mean, it's not like they leave, for example, Ukraine or Syria or, or Iraq. Uh, or Afghanistan, and they give the number over to the government. So you're like, who are you texting? And if you even, even if the text somehow managed to go to the people, the, the traffickers themselves, they're not going to tell them anything. In fact, they'll just go, nah, it's just propaganda. Once you're there, you're there. So uh, it's it's like, just drop it in a, in a We Are Smugglers WhatsApp group. It's fine. <laughs> So maybe this is a good segue into uh, our next topic, which is the, the candidates. So maybe we can get your opinion on who would be the the least worst candidate. <laughs> I've got to quote, there's a guy a guy called Bennett Aaron who, um, who actually said this. He said, it's like 
choosing your lead what is it the worst the, 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 it's like choosing a toilet on the fourth day of Clastonbury or something like that it's like there's no good option <laughs> all the toilets are going to be full of shit <laughs> so accurate mm. <laughs> I think we've all been there done that <laughs> Femi what, what, what are you what are your thoughts on the, on the worst uh, so uh, the, throughout this entire thing my, my brain has been uh, trying to fight between the two halves on the one half you've got do we want the the genuinely least worst option in order to protect people in the short term, people who somebody who won't do the worst kind of things the Tories are known for, or do we want a continuity Boris a candidate who won't allow the Tories to get away with some sort of clean slate by changing the leader, even though that continuity, even even though whatever leader they have, it's still somebody who signed up the Boris Johnson, so none of them are actively any better. They've just got better better marketing. Um, so I don't know. Penny Mordaunt, I feel like, and everybody's are, are on this on this page. She's the most. She's the most she candidate. Seems to be most likely to win. She has most support from the members of the Conservative Party, and because people don't really know her that well, she has the cleanest slate. Now you are on the front page of the Observer this morning, a warning that a million people may come here from Turkey in the next eight years, which is strange because very few people expect Turkey to join the EU in the next eight years. I think it's, it's very likely that they will, um, in part because of the migrant crisis. Uh, it's escalating and in, uh, speeding up uh, Turkey in particular, but other accession countries uh, coming in. And so that ability to just say, oh, we've, we've moved past Boris Johnson, we've now got a traditional conservative, even though she's just as uh, her record's just as bad as it, as the rest of them. It's it's worrying. Could that could that work against her? So it could work to you know in her favor be, to become leader of the Conservative Party. But if there's a general election in two years' time, could that work against her? Because mm -hmm. then we'd start to realize what she's really like. I, I think she'll stay. I think she's going to stay fairly moderate at least at least for the time being. Yeah, I, I think I think she's going to stay moderate for a while, um, and at least try and sell that because I think. But I think all parties that aren't Boris are very aware that they need to try and reclaim the centre ground. Labour is explicitly trying to do that. And so we might get to a point where um, she's the centre-right candidate and Labour has got the centre-centre candidate. And so they're just basically trying to grab the same amount of votes. Um, I saw Marina wasn't entirely in agreement with my notion of her being just as bad as the rest of them. I think, no, I think she is. I think she is as bad. Uh, okay, I think she's the the second least worst option. I think the first least worst option is Tom Tugendhat. I think okay. he 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 feels a little bit more neutral. There are a few things like regarding his. I mean, I, I know they're all pro Brexit or they're pretending to be because they need to mm. pretend to be. But he mm -hmm. seems to be. I don't know. He he hasn't been. He's he's never done the round supporting Johnson. He hasn't been out as far as I can see you know, dishing out barefaced lies like Penny Mordaunt did when she was mm. talking about... Um, Turkey. Exactly, and, and UK not having a veto on Turkey. Um, so, I don't know, this, and he's called out a few things as well um, with regards to the Afghanistan um, withdrawal as well. He called out how shocking that was. Yes. And I think there's a few things there. Um, he's also not as small state. He has alluded to the fact that taxes need to be lower, but he's not one of these people that is, is all about small state, small government. So I don't know, like he, he feels the, the least dangerous to me, but I don't think he's going to get anywhere near um, the leadership. He's, not, yeah, cr I he's mean, not crazy enough, yeah. No. Yeah, but I mean, that, that's, uh, that's what I was referring to about the... Uh notion of the the two party leaders kind of coming close to, closer together if he was if he was in charge he's the one that said recently we need to make brexit deliver because it's not currently delivering so that's basically the, uh, a, like a thesaurus of what Keir Starmer is saying about exactly. brexit then you're just neutral to Starmer but you've got all the baggage of Boris and the last 13 years of trash and like i mean one of the key components to winning an election i would say there are 13 one of them would be short term long term economy they could have a year and a half to, to be in power from September. They're not mm. going to do anything with that. And I've listened to all their policies. None of them actually address the actual problem, no. which is uh, three or four fold in terms of economics. So all of them turning around, I think apart from Sunak, and saying, oh, we're going to drop the taxes. It's like, that doesn't solve the problem. Corporation tax going up will help. But 
ultimately, you're just going to have to go to the people who have the money, the rich. Well, they won't do that. They, they, they won't touch that with the barge pole because they know that's where they're getting finance from, that and the Russians. Who I mean, would you... Rather than did actually, although she's out, is it Brave or Brave One? I never know. She um she actually did promise to lower VAT on energy, but so she was the only one that was making something that was a direct link to the cost of living crisis. But um she's gone now. Thank goodness. Yeah, I mean, yeah, she was a she was an awful, awful human being, uh, if you can even call her human. She um she was definitely something along the lines of like blaming the people on benefits and then helped yeah. herself to 150k in in expenses plus yeah. she's already on like 150 i mean it's maddening no i was going to say and, and there's also the erg which is receiving as far as i know receiving public funding and she doesn't have a problem with that yeah and she said we spend too much money on on benefits she said we need to get rid of the quote culture of dependency um and said there's so we've all, universal credits has, has helped to deal with the culture of dependency but there's still more we can do they're shot away they literally don't live in our universe it's no, literally like a multiverse somewhere else. And, and I also think, I think it's hilarious how so many of them have just come out to like with these campaign videos harking back to their youth and how they were so hard done by. <laughs> and, you know, my grandfather and came over and I want to get... You're actually saying, how can you not see the hypocrisy of what you're saying in your campaign video? You know, my it was my grandmother came over here from wherever and so what have you done? So you've stopped your voting for laws that stop other people doing exactly what your grandma did. And, and he's one of many. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Loads of support services. And, I just, and, and also, he even, he even chucks in the line, I want the other people to have the same opportunities as me. You just Christ. <laughs> like, how do you get your head around? You are lying. You are saying the opposite of what you are doing or have done. And one of the things that kind of irks me is, is how the candidates with from ethnic minorities keep repeating this line of... Um, and the I'm so grateful for the opportunities this country has given me. Yeah. Just fueling that narrative of basically minorities should be grateful to the white majority. Oh it's, gosh. It's, yeah. It's it's every single one of them has done it in everything. And and, and Suella has very publicly, because when she was campaigning for vote leave, she was an Erasmus student. Yes. Oh, you're joking. She, yeah, she was, was an Erasmus student. She worked, um, I think it was over, over in France. She worked for the European. So basically, you can't get a more pro European CV. And yet, ERG, she is an ERG member pushing for the hardest of Brexit. Well, it's. We, it's what, um, sorry, Fanny, go ahead. Uh, it's what I said. The, these, we are dealing with people who. Are part of a government that calculated in 2019 that no matter what Brexit they negotiate, we will end up poorer as a result. And they all stood on a manifesto to deliver a thing that they knew, based on their best available expertise, would make people poor. So they're, by definition, not in this to help people. They're in this because they know that it helps them, knowing it hurts other people. So we should um, not be surprised at any lack of morality. So, so there was an interesting exception to that, which was with Patrick Minford, the uh, academic professor from card and his policy and this is also interesting within brexit his policy was to go complete free trade and be like right we'll just ditch everything and we'll go high tech but in order to go high tech in our ability as a country you bye need bye to farming, bye bye cars. sorry Femi? bye bye farming bye bye cars yeah exactly which he said in committee in front of zaha way in front of like other key members and they all so it was quite funny watching Zahawi, considering how much like money he sort of made, he couldn't get his head around it, and Patrick Minford pretty much called him an idiot. He's word salad. He is pure word salad, that man. You can't, <laughs> I'm like, I, I played like the recording of him with um, uh, Kay, what's her name? Kay Burley. Sky Burley. Sports, yeah, Kay Burley on Sky Sports yesterday. Three times, I'm like, he's not saying anything or nothing I can make sense of. And also you can tell he's tripping up on his words because he's a bloody liar. Tax, Z Z Z uh, allegedly, a tax evading liar. Allegedly, <laughs> Zaha Zahar is, is incredible because the the U turn that he made last week is insane. It was literally, I think, thirty six hours apart. The um, I think Boris Johnson is a man of integrity, determined to deliver for this country. To he's a man without <laughs> integrity, and therefore must get out of office. <laughs> What? <laughs> but but he accepted a job from him. Yeah. And then the next day he was like, Yeah, boss, you should step down. <laughs> 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 it's 
<laughs> but then these people could flip reverse it like insane. The th- so Sajid Javid, right, this is another one. Sajid Javid as health secretary, 20, 24 days ago, before he became, 24 days before he was then PM uh, candidate, he was talking about the national insurance levy, right? And he was talking about how vital it was, how it was going to raise X billion um, uh, to go into like fixing the backlog issues and the staffing issues of the NHS. Very pro. He did the rounds. That was his vibe. 24 days later, as candidate for PM, vows to sw- scrap it. It's gone. Like, wh- you, what What did you believe? Should it have happened? Yeah. Just, they, they just no, say no, they whatever don't, they need to say. Exactly. They don't actually believe in anything. They will say whatever they believe will actually help them. That's all it's about. And Trust has said that, by the way. Trust, because she's obviously been confronted over the fact that she is, was a Remainer. She campaigned for Remain. And she mm-hmm. has said, I think it was in an article yesterday, she said um, that she was being loyal to David Cameron. Well, if you're just, if you're just being loyal to someone, you're your boss, your leader... How can we trust that you're ever going to do anything that's for the good of the country? You just the most important thing is your loyalty to the person who basically gives you your job. She repeated that today um, when she was asked, "Why didn't you leave Boris Johnson's cabinet?" And she said, "Well, because I'm loyal." To what? If Boris no, Johnson was in that bunker, I'd be still in there <laughs> with him too. You know, it's insane. <laughs> but, but what what blew my mind was how Jacob Rees-Mogg and uh, Nadine Doris stood in front of Number Ten and said how. <laughs> Liz Truss is a is a hard was it is a is a harder Brexiteer than either of us. Is a what sorry? Is a harder Brexiteer? Harder yeah. or a uh, truer uh, yeah, truer it, Brexiteer? It, I don't remember the exact. Yeah, term. It, 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 it was. I can't remember because I remember the audio was difficult. But it was either as hard a Brexiteer as either of us, or a harder Brexiteer as either. Of us. Uh, I'm very aware that she's probably a stronger Brexiteer than both of us. Liz Truss is as loyal as her options. <laughs> she will stay loyal to whoever pays her the most money. I would have liked to have had subtitles underneath Mog and uh, Doris as they said that, which basically read something along the lines of, we're so hated by the public, we would never be able to run for Prime Minister. <laughs> and they didn't see what they were saying when they said that. I mean, it was really bizarre. I mean, the whole thing is... because I. I I tell you what, I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a curveball of a question. Who would you like to be locked in a room with for an hour out of that five? Ooh, read the names again. So you got Liz Truss, yep. Penny Morden, Kemi, Sunat, Tujinar. Do I have a camera? I'm gonna get like the countdown clock and I'm gonna give you like the <laughs> I think trust, trust, because I'd want to grill the shit out of her about how she's so two-faced and like, what the hell are you playing at? Like, we can see everything you're doing. You talked about the fact when you were pro Remain, don't tell me it was your loyalty to David Cameron, because you talked about the opportunity for your daughters and you wanted your daughters to grow up in a country where they could go and travel and work freely. Now, that wasn't bollocks. That was when you were used to talk some sense. So what the hell are you doing? Everyone can see through you. You're pathetic. And we've just learned that she basically sold out UK farming when she dropped our trousers for the Australian trade deal, just so she could go out and tell people, woohoo, we've got a trade deal. So her loyalty is stronger to David Cameron than to her daughters. Okay. <laughs> basically. <laughs> oh, wow, brutal. <laughs> um, I, I think I'm definitely um, more than uh, as long as I as long as I can record it, I'm I'm I'm, <laughs> I, I'm good because I, I I need I need to basically press her on because she's gonna she's gonna try and play that soft angle for over the next few months of I I I can be a traditional conservative I'll be sensible with the economy uh, and I'll basically nail her to what has Brexit done for Portsmouth your constituency. For the country, for the people who who you told, for the fishermen, for the farmers, etc. And why did you why did you support it? You say that you care about the, about the cost of the living crisis. Why have you consistently voted to reduce benefits? Why have you always vo- voted to um, cut tax to people who are earning over one hundred fifty thousand pounds? And just basically grill her in the ways that the, the journalists such as Kate Burley will not do. Mm. Oh, I'd love to watch that, mm. Max. I I'd say Liz Trust because I. For pretty much the same reasons as Marina, but uh, I was also thinking Rishi Sunak because I'm fascinated by the idea that there's a billionaire driving around in a 
in a 10 year old golf uh, just why <laughs> that'd be my first question i thought it was a kia kia something or other. no no he was putting petrol in the kia rio it was um ah. but he he drives around in his with his family in a in a i think it's a 10 or 15 year old golf really <laughs> so the, wasn't that the car that belonged to the guy who worked at sainsbury's the kia was he the borrowed kia it was. work okay. the guy at sainsbury's had a better car than the billionaire <laughs> yeah <laughs> And Alex, who would you like to be stuck in a room with? I, easily none of them. I don't want to be anywhere near them. They're horrible, horrible human beings. You have to, you have to choose one. I know. I'd be... I'm going to be a bit nice and be like... I'd be interested to sit down with Kemp and just find out how she ended up with that philosophy. It boggles my mind. And being part of the Conservative Party when you've got Boris Johnson, who's clearly a racist. I mean, literally, the Biden administration. Like Kamala Harris and Biden just consider him a racist. The administration considers him a racist. Most people with any common sense considers uh, Boris Johnson a racist. Why would you be part of that party? Are you, are you literally willing to give over your morals to such an extent? that you would throw them away just so you can get a bit of power, a chance of it. It reminds me of, I've met, I've met a girl, I met a woman before and she said to me, um, I don't have women friends because um, they're just too bitchy. I just only have male friends. It reminds me a bit of that. Yep, just, internalized just, uh, misogyny. Yeah. Yep. So I, 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 exactly. <laughs> it, 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 it's not unique to race because uh, as Marie said, just internal, internalized mis misogyny. There's um, pretty much mm -hmm. with it with the banning of policies that would ban her own family from entering the country. There's also what we've just discussed. There's Liz Truss um, um, campaigning against Erasmus, scrapped scrapping Erasmus when she knows it will hurt people. Um, he, uh, Nigel Farage met his wife in Germany all, while working there, taking advantage of his freedom of movement rights. These people know that they've already achieved all the stuff they need to achieve. So they're okay backing policies that will hurt other people who are in a similar position to what they were. Literally putting up the ladder behind them. I said, like, I, I can't, my mum and dad are from Sicily. They benefited from freedom of movement. They, they came over here. They created a life. They, you know, three kids. I can't imagine ever getting into politics and going, what am I going to do? I'm going to make sure no one else can do what my mum and dad did. I just can't imagine. You've got to be rotten from the inside like to, to do that. It's um, interesting because there are one of the history modules that I teach is on America in the 1900s, 1920s. And there's literally a series of cartoons saying the exact same message that you said there. What's good for our forefathers is no longer good for anyone else. And literally like people being ousted from the country. And it's almost like, oh, I've got my way. So no one else can share in that because I want to secure my power. And it was also interesting as well. I was, <laughs> of all the things I was reading today, uh, I was reading Socrates' dialogues, and it was interesting as well because you all brought it up and said, why are they all going in this direction? Why do they head towards the conservatives? And this was said three and a half thousand years ago. People with wealth who had nothing and created their own wealth tend to obsess about wealth. And you look at that list, and a lot of them are all self-made, and you go, they're all obsessing about wealth. They're all thinking it's trickle-down economics. And I sort of think to myself, Maybe it is just an obsession with money. That's why they all end up going towards the, the Conservative Party. I can't speak for all of them, because I don't know how many are self-made, but I know a number of them are. And some will advocate the fact, you know, I came here with nothing, my parents came here with nothing, and now I'm rich, and now I want to cut that crossing over. Yep. It's, um, it's disturbing stuff. Does anyone else have anything to say on this? Yes, on so um, there's definitely the element of because everybody thinks that they've worked hard during their life, but they don't recognize that not everybody who worked as hard as they did achieved what they did. And that comes down to the two types of person, the two types of privilege. There's privilege that believes it deserves it and privilege that knows it doesn't. And no starker, there's been no starker example from, for that, that in my life than once when I did um, a debate with Lord Digby Jones, um, so conservative peer, and it was, he was basically saying, yeah, we told everybody that Brexit would make them poorer. Well, that's what we were really clear about that. Now, obviously he wasn't because he, he drove around in a bus that said he'd be 53 and 50 million pounds a week richer. But he said, no, people accepted that we, we would be poor, but we did it for sovereignty. And I was like, that's an absolute disgrace. After the interview, he asked me, so what house were you in? What? What house were you in at school? Uh, um, we went to the same fucking school. Um, 
we both went to a, pri- to, to, a, to a posh private school and he grew up to think that it's okay to deprive people who didn't have the same opportunities. That's, what, that's the two types of privilege. I recognize that I don't deserve the privileges that I grew up with. And that's why I do everything I can to try and make sure that we make, get a more equal society. He's actively and knowingly trying to hurt the people who are at the bottom because he thinks that, well, I'm here, I'm good. Sorry, Max. So, no, I just wanted, I, I really don't understand. I, I understand his, well, I don't agree. Obviously, I don't agree and I don't fully understand his position. But I really don't understand people who would vote, who are in a position where they are struggling and they look at people like Digby Jones and, and they say, yeah, I want to vote for someone like that even though they know that you know, they have no nothing but contempt for the working class or because they or, don't know they don't know that but what they do know what they because what parties like the Tory party do are they they make um the person down the road on the benefits the one with mm-hmm. the flat screen tv that's the enemy and that's much closer to that person that average voter so well i don't have much but i don't want her having more than me they don't make the comparison between themselves and the Lord Digby Joneses because those people are over there. In fact, there's almost, an, sadly, which I hate, is that people are so deferential in this business, in this business, in this country, and they sort of say they take their rightful places. Oh, we're down here, and like, Jacob Rees Mogg's up there, and he sounds like very posh, and he must know what he's talking about. So they don't, they don't go. Well, why has that person got absolutely shitloads, and I've got nothing? They look to the person over there, which the Tory party is pointing the finger at and going. That's the reason you can't get a hospital appointment or a GP appointment. Uh, and, the, the and then you have, yeah, the, and you have like the Sun or the, the Daily Mail reinforcing this as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's one of the differences between the there's, UK. There's UK. historical precedent for this. I mean, I know for a fact that if you, in the British Army in the 1800s during the Napoleonics, they looked for the guy with the posh accent to be in charge. They didn't want people risen from the ranks because they considered the ones in charge from the lords and knights and sirs and whatever else to be special, to be lucky. It's been in, it's been in our system, I would argue, since the Norman Conquest, since 1066, where you got a clear class divide. And this is why Latin is, you know, considered the posh language, because you can bring it back to the Norman roots. They spoke French, they spoke Latin. The English at the time, they were living there, more likely to speak Norse, which is where we get a lot of our words from. So you look at it and you go, that class system just seems to have been embedded all for the last thousand years. And it's still there. Because as you said, people li- listen to Reese Mogg and they just hear this posh, wobbly accent or Boris. And they think, right, well, you know, they must know it's what they're talking about. Because they've it's, got- also, it's also conviction. I think you listen to how mm. people talk and the campaign videos would be a great example of this. They talk with utter unwavering conviction. Most people don't talk like that. Most people be like, um, Think this is the case or correct me if i'm wrong or do you know i really want my hope is this but they are so convinced that they will deliver this and that and yeah there's no room for doubt and if there is and they're ever challenged on that doubt if there is they double down on it so and again i think people aren't used to just people brazenly lying to them so they think well it must be they must be telling the truth can, can well, I ask? Can I ask? I just, I just want to ask Femi about that because is, is that one of the reasons why Brexit, you know, the the vote went the Brexit way back in 2016 because the Brexiteers were, everything will be wonderful. Believe me, it's true. Sunlit uplands, uh, you know, we they need us more than we need them, and they were so convinced by it that it the, that the public probably went along with not not completely, but the the public went along with it in a, in a sense. Oh, we're getting onto a onto a dangerous topic because because <laughs> uh, because it's uh, we're, we're basically saying Cameron Cameron and Corbyn, namely Corbyn, were they too on the fence about the EU in order to in order to sell it? I, I I don't. There are lots of criticisms to be made about about Jeremy Corbyn in terms of how he handled Brexit. I don't think his lack of conviction about the eu being perfect was was the um was was the main one to focus on because i do think as you said earlier it is good to recognize the flaws in the eu um but say look here are the, here are the pros here are the cons here's the massive con that would happen we can manage this but here but but but, but we can't afford to do that i think that's 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 the issue it's interesting you bring that because I sort of look at this and it, again, it feels almost like 
so many people in the UK have been made poor for a variety of reasons. I would probably argue for quantitative easing being one of the biggest reasons. Um, housing prices being another. It almost felt like if we got away from the EU, I get to become rich again. I get to get another golden ticket into that lottery that allow me to become middle class, upper class, and we can get on with everything. Or even even it can be, and for some it could be, actually gives me the ability to put bread on the table again, which I haven't been able to do for a variety of reasons. And yet, as you said, it's it's just a complete and utter lie and sham that they've been sold. It's almost, it almost feels like in many ways, they, everyone was told they were gonna get a Ferrari mm -hmm. and it was gonna be the best Ferrari ever and it's gonna be better than anything they've had in the past. And then they get the Ferrari and they find out the engine's knackered, but it just about moves. And no one's like willing to admit that the engine's knackered. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it feels like a complete false sales pitch that's being made. And so, it's because someone exploited poverty in order to be able to achieve that. And exploited trust. Yeah, I think it, I think it's always important. I know a lot of people will have heard, heard this before, but to just to really drill into why people voted for Brexit uh, in in the first place and make sure we got that on record, because I didn't understand it. I was like most of us um, who just thought it was all all one way, and then the moment, but the moment I started campaigning in about late May, early June, two thousand sixteen, like on the street and speaking to people just around Birmingham. I knew it was going to go the wrong way, and but I didn't fully understand it until I went up and visited Sunderland, and I I, sp I spoke to some people up there, and, and one guy basically really explained to me a guy called Stephen France, and he was just basically like, imagine being um, fifty years old now or eleven years old back when Thatcher closed the shipyards, and your dad lost his job, you've seen your area get nothing your entire life, and you've seen London get more investment every single year. Millennium Dome, London Eye, there's, not, there's never been a tube system in Hull. Um, and, and as a result, you know that the system does not work for you. You voted Labour your entire life because Thatcher closed the shipyards and you hate the Tories, but nothing changes because Labour knows they've always got your vote. And so they have no incentive to help you, neither do the Tories because they're never going to get your vote. And so politics has objectively left you behind. And the one time that you might actually get a chance to change things, one time where your vote might actually count because a referendum, every vote counts, Mm -hmm. um, is you've got David Cameron, the same person uh, person who put you and your family through eight years of austerity, telling you to vote for status quo. Under those circumstances, if you're not an expert in EU law, which pretty much nobody was, you're going to vote leave. And so, I, yeah. I, as I said before, I don't hold it against people. And the, I, as Marina said, it is comes down to trust. And people did not trust the political system. They knew that it wasn't working for them. And they didn't think politicians cared about them. They saw them as living in their ivory towers down in London. And they thought, we need some politicians that we, that we can trust, politicians that recognize the system is broken, who really want to change things. And Boris Johnson did really well to tap into that. Unfortunately, this is the same man who once said that a pound spent in Corian is worth more than a pound spent in Strathclyde. He does not give a shit about regional inequality. And as a result, we've seen all the stuff we've seen since. To, um, uh, uh, choosing an A-level algorithm scheme that, prefer, that prefers private schools over state schools, uh, depriving school kids of school meals, leaving the North behind and only giving them furlough when London needed it. This is not somebody that believes in leveling up at all, but he's tapped into the dire needs of the most desperate people in the country mm -hmm. and utterly betrayed them. Yeah, pretty much. They had an economic policy, which they seem to be going with, which is Patrick Minford's, which is free trade, but make everything in the UK high tech. Well, we invest in the education system. I've not heard one policy that you can go definitively will improve the education system, which is exactly what you need if you want to gear everyone up towards like a high tech equ uh, economy. So they're not shrinking classes. They're not. They, they argued over free school meals. I mean, Suella Braverman was talking about just completely scrapping it, saying that kids are dependent. And yet we know that diet is one of the biggest contributors to improving intelligence, exercise, smaller classrooms. None of it's been put out there, and we can't even do half of it now because we can't recruit the teachers. We can't recruit anything from anywhere because we've got a complete labour shortage across the country. And also, you'd be a teacher. Sorry, so, so say, just so, some of the industries where we have got these massive shortfalls. Who would do them? Like the NHS, for example, teaching. Like we are relying on people who are just <laughs> vocational. They are. It's their calling to teach. It's their calling to look after people, and yet we punish them when they're in their roles with these ridiculous salaries by pointing the finger at them. You know, think how many times the right-wing press have pointed the finger at teachers or whoever, like for being, you know, it was, it was lefty lawyers the other day. 
Um, and I just think we're um, we're we're, we're um, relying on people's good nature to fill those roles, and that's not going to work. And now we've just booted out a massive chunk of our work workforce because of, of, of Brexit. I think we're in a real dire state. I know, I know if my little boy, you saw just <laughs> not that long ago, uh, you know, told my, me he wanted to grow up and be a teacher or he wanted to grow up and work in the NHS, I, I'd support him, but I'd be probably a little bit sad for him because I know it's, it's probably going to be a tough life. Well, the hours and the, um, certainly the hours for the NHS staff, but also just the, the how you're treated. Like, not even to get free parking at work. What on earth is that about? That, that is what, you know, something I just rant about all the time. You know, can you... Is, is there any other workplace where you actually have to pay to park? Like I worked in offices where there was parking spaces. You go there and you park your car. You don't think about, okay, well, I need to put some money in the meter. In the same, and NHS, got, yeah, at least in Scotland, they got rid of it. So in NHS Scotland, there is free parking for NHS staff. Just the idea that NHS staff, they're clapped one day and then they have to put money in the meter the next. It's I ridiculous. know that it was seen as a win that during COVID... Parking charges were scrapped, I think, temporarily, <laughs> and they're reintroduced. Like, how can you justify that? They should have never been around yet to begin with. Uh, well, they pay national insurance, which is paying their own wage. <laughs> Work that yeah, one out. That's the first thing they could have scrapped and gone, right, we can't give you a pay rise, but we'll scrap the income tax that we've got, which is paying for your own wages. Mm. That would have been nice. But no, you got a better treatment in World War One as a soldier than you did as a nurse during a pandemic. Like you would do eight weeks on, and then you get to go in the reserve trench, and then you get time out of the trenches. Didn't get any of that during all of this. You're just thrown in, and the COVID rates have gone up again. Yep. So they're throwing them back into the whole mess. Yep. Like the WHO came out yesterday, uh, this week, and said, "Oh, the pattern, it's not over, but we don't hear anything about it in our press." But, but right wing, but right wing media will say, "Yeah, but that's what you that's what you signed up for," you know. Just deal with it. Yeah, uh, it, yeah. The situation in the hospitals is, is insane to me because um, it was about four weeks ago that they re finally removed masks in the hospitals and then two weeks ago they brought them back. Wow. Wow. Was that, was that in relation to what was happening in the hospitals or was that in relation to COVID spreading? I think it's COVID spread um, across, across, across the board. So it was a national um, flip-flop. I would have hoped that they'd do the same thing with the public transport system and just say, bring back masks. Let's try and yeah. reduce the transmission, take some pressure off. Is yeah. it really that big a deal to wear a mask on public transport for the majority of the population? No. But will they do it? Will they bugger? Not anymore. Uh, but no, didn't, but didn't, didn't Boris get COVID done? <laughs> just like but, he got Brexit done. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it's over. There's nothing to worry about. We got done. <laughs> the, the, thing, the thing with masks is that they they they, they mess it up they, they can never do masks this country can't do masks now because the messaging on it has been messaging on it has been so poor yeah. not not in ter not in terms of a making it compulsory having a system whereby you either have a mask or a lanyard everybody can do one of those two things um or um and explaining why why masks work what they do um and showing the evidence behind it and what kind of mask, because uh, and it, it kind of breaks my heart when I see, when I go on public transport, R right now my, my policy is basically, if I see anybody wearing a mask on the train, I'll wear a mask, because that means that that, that person is probably worried about, or worried about them, they might be vulnerable. Um, but I see people wearing a mask, but they'll just be wearing the surgical one, which doesn't protect you. It's just for protecting others. And so I'm like, you're clearly, you, you're probably vulnerable, but you're not because you have, but you haven't been told how to protect yourself. It comes back to messaging again, which is which is a huge, huge weakness of Mark Bob Boris. He can message it's, about it's, himself. It, he can't, but, he can't. It, but they can't. If you look, if the Tory Party are actually shit at comms. Uh, actually, I tell lie. They're good at comms when they lie about stuff. Their heart is hard hitting and it, it reaches. But if you look at like their campaign videos and stuff, they haven't got a bloody clue. Some of the things that have been allowed to go out the door, like Penny Mordaunt's video. There is an, a rumour circulating that her team let that go. They okayed it because they wanted to troll her, basically, because there were so many things with her video. So they've obviously, they've, they've used the Paralympian in there, who, without his pr permission, who asked to be removed. They had Oscar Pistorius in there. Uh, okay. Um, they featured a policeman. You're not allowed to politicise the police. They also featured Joe Cox in there. Like this, there were so many no-no's. Uh, not to mention, on top of that, they she listed British listed British values and and said we need leadership, but didn't include honesty among those British values. 
And then as, as the best example of our values having an impact, it cut to Boris Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure you weren't watching this spoof? <laughs> <laughs> they look you can't it's hard to tell it's like it's like parody accounts on twitter i genuinely can't tell the difference like john is it john redmond is that his name john redwood oh, yeah john Red, Red, redwood sorry there is a parody and there's john redwood and i just it's so hard to tell the difference <laughs> yeah Ro, rosie, rosie jones remember rosie jones rosie holt is having Holden. a very hard time <laughs> yeah even there was even a tory mp who criticized her not criticized her but said this is pathetic. This this MP should not. Who elected this individual? It's like, uh, okay, I've reached peak uh, peak trolling at this stage. I get a feeling that all four of us could do better videos. Was <laughs> ridiculous, and we don't have the budget. You don't even need the budget. I mean, Sonia Braveman's video. Oh yeah, it was awful. It was like nineteen nineties again. Even so, <laughs> even so, Ron was better than that. Yeah. <laughs> you so should have, Sir Ron. So should have run. <laughs> Did you see actually a, a really interesting article uh, yesterday um, where Ipsos Mori conducted, they did some polling to see how people, um, what they knew about the Tory leaders in the contest, the PM. And um, Lewis Stewart polled, okay, actually, people thought that six percent of the poll uh, pollsters thought they knew him fairly well. There is no Lewis Stewart. It just shows you that we might as well just, we'll just pack up and go home. <laughs> Or, if you want to be a bit Machiavellian, it gives us a large, large advantage that we're able to manipulate people on that scale, which, which you know, isn't is that as well. Yeah. Uh, can, can I ask one, <laughs> one fine? Oh, 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 so, sorry. I've just remember you just reminded me that, that there was a poll done among Republican voters, and I think it was I think forty three percent of them said we should invade Agrabah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think Agrabah's lovely this time of year. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was another there was another poll of republicans in in the u.s and they were asked uh would you disown your child if you discovered that they were a homo sapien and uh i think a majority of them said yes they would disown their, <laughs> their son or daughter if it turned out to be a homo sapien this is why this is why it's, but, elections but we've now, got to protect the unborn <laughs> oh my god <laughs> until they're born then they're on their own this is why every every election now, I just feel like I'm getting into a car with a drunk driver. Like you just don't know where the car's going to go. Probably off a cliff. And just what, oh. before, I, I know we're near the end now, but I just wanted to ask a question because I heard a rumour, I hope it's just a rumour, but Boris Johnson may be starting his own party. Did anyone hear that rumour? <laughs> Inject it. A cheese Inject and wine it. party? Please tell me it's just a cheese and wine party. <laughs> But it'd be amazing. He would split the vote. Can you imagine if Boris was running against the Tories? Oh, God. <laughs> Unless he would it's, do a barrage, them. The Brexit, so he would Brexit be, party? Yeah, the real Brexit yeah. party? <laughs> yeah, but then he would sort of uh, strike a deal with the Tory party to yeah. not stand on that. I don't know. Who knows? I'm slightly hoping that will happen and then the Reform Party as well and really split the, the right wing. I mean, that would be beautiful. That and UKIP as well. But, mm. I mean, UKIP's, UKIP's looking done and dusted these days, isn't it? I don't think it's no, not. No. Talking of splitting the vote, though, I think it's really important to note that for the Tory leadership election, Tory PM leadership election, they don't use first past the post. Oh, no. They use multi-round voting because first past the post would mean they'd end up with a PM that the majority of them didn't want. And yet the rest of us have to just suck up. First and my favorite, my favorite thing about that was that uh, Dominic Rob was on stage what, uh, supporting Rishi the other day, and he said that look, we've got to make sure we, we get a leader who doesn't have to learn on the job because we've got a real threat coming, and that mm -hmm. real threat is the a, a socialist government propped up by the Lib Dems and the SNP, and we know what their price is, and a, a referendum on electoral reform. You're stood on stage in a multi-round voting system because you, as, as Marina just said, you don't want to PM the majority didn't vote for. And you're saying we need to elect this guy to avoid everybody's votes counting in the country. I mean, they yeah. obviously deleted the mayoral elections in London as well as a few yeah. others mm. on that premise. Police commissioner like a pretty well. decent system, but not for the rest. Again, it's one rule for them and one rule for the rest of us. It's always mm. been like that. 
Mm. They think they're above us and we're the little people and we should just suck up whatever they tell us to do. But you would think that because we keep voting these pricks into power. Well, I don't. <laughs> well, I, don't, don't, vote for the, I the, don't. The, the, I think it's. I think it's. It's really important that we always remember that the Tory support has always been the minority. Mm. That we they they they've never had a majority. Mm. Not in, in every single four, 1958, 1959, um, the majority of the parties have left the Conservatives. So we're a progressive voting country being strangled by first past the post and always have been. That's a nice segue. So what are Labour's chances then, Femi? Starmer's um, strategy is clearly we need to reclaim the central ground. He's broken pretty much all of his um, leadership pledges in order to basically try to bring on the left, try to bring on Remainers. Uh, and he's gone straight down the middle uh, on every issue. And so and that is working for him. Um, he is definitely convincing a lot of uh, traditional softer Tories that he's a safe pair of hands for them. However, I still don't think it works because the whole reason why you do that is so that you're no longer seen as toxic by the Lib Dems who couldn't get into an electoral pact with Corbyn because their voter base would abs absolutely despise Corbyn. So you move to the centre so that you can form that electoral pact without anybody hating the other side. But if you're A pro-Brexit and B, aren't offering a, uh, an um, electoral reform, then the Lib Dems will never do a pact with you because what would be the point? We're going to have to constantly give up or give up our seats to, to, in order to do this? No. When, and so you have to have electoral reform as a, as a firm policy. So if, given that we have got 83% of Labour members who support for proportional representation, we have got the majority of unions now supporting proportional representation, uh, it should be policy uh, at next conference unless there's a really insidious move by the leadership to prevent it. On that basis, if that happens, I think we're in a very strong position come come December. But in a if, strong position for Labour to win outright with, or as uh, a coalition? I genuinely hope it's not outright. I genuinely hope they are in a coalition with Lib Dems and SNP because I honestly don't trust Lake Keir Starmer as far as I can throw him. I want him to feel he has to um, give us a, a fair voting system. That's my concern as well, is every time, obviously I'm very happy to see Labour climbing in the polls, but I am concerned that this will mean that he won't feel any pressure to put exactly. electoral reform on the manifesto. Exactly. And I'm the same as you, um, Fermi. I just um, I had hopes for Starmer and mm -hmm. I am just losing them. And I feel like part of the problem is he doesn't come up with, he is pandering to like Tory voters basically. And also his stance on Brexit. Now, I understand the need to play the game with Brexit. I understand you can't talk about rejoining, but he is so, you know, you can leave the, the, door, the, the door ajar in the way you speak about it. You can talk about the fact that when I'm in power, I will revisit the problems left by Brexit or address how we can make things work. Don't say you will never rejoin the customs union or the single market. That to me is just... I mean, only a third of Labour voters voted to leave. Why are you alienating two thirds of your, your support by doing that? And so many of us, and so many of us are now thinking, just, who do we vote for? Like, yeah. I, I just want to play devil's advocate a little bit um, because I, I remember listening to a call to James O'Brien some months ago where there was, a, I think his name was Richard. He called in and he said, look, if Keir Starmer talks about rejoining the EU or rejoining the single market, Johnson can sell that to the public as losing something uh, or something taken away. Now, I don't know if I agree with that completely, but I think the idea being that if you, if Starmer says, look, we're going to rejoin the EU or rejoin the single market, it will be seen as undoing Brexit or taking something away. So he would be a better approach would be to say, look, Brexit doesn't have to mean NHS NHS hospital closures or or Brexit doesn't have to mean your business going under Brexit doesn't have to mean mountains of paperwork in a sense you're being a little bit dishonest with the public but in in another sense you're you're not giving Johnson something that he can use against you because you're not saying I'm going to take something away I, I don't it'd be good to get your you guys your opinion on that the idea that Starmer wouldn't be taking something away by saying Brexit doesn't have to mean extra paperwork, for example. But in a, in a real sense, what he would be doing would be he'd be trying to reduce paperwork by, you know, doing more agreements with the EU. With the EU. 
uh, but that would come after the election. Possibly if he was using that type of language, but he's not. He's painting himself into a corner. And also things like closer alignment with the EU, which I think he has actually talked about, that's not going to fix the problem of Northern Ireland. So we're just, um, we're just talking in riddles here. And it, it just needs honesty. Unfortunately, uh, often this argument yet again manipulates people with a false binary of he can either be gung-ho for Brexit or he has to say rejoin. Those aren't the only options. Mm -hmm. And all he has to do, even if he doesn't himself like criticize Brexit, which he should, he should be saying this is about damage limitation, not keep saying Brexit, make Brexit work as if Brexit can ever be a good thing. All he has to do and all he should have been doing from the start is just, and we should have seen this by now, him go to, go visit a fishing village, go, go visit a farm, go visit a small business and, and, and have yourself filmed talking to those people, asking them, hey, how have things been going since January 2021? Mm -hmm. Why? What have you been facing? Why is this happening to you? And if those videos were put out of him literally just talking to people, showing that I'm not here out of some mad Romani Romaniac um, ambition or ideology, I'm just here to serve the British people who right now are suffering and I will fix, I'll fix whatever they need me to fix. And he's not doing that because jo you can't argue against that. If Johnson even tried, he has to admit he's hurting people. If, if, if Sir Starmer's position is, I will only fix things that are hurting the British people. If Johnson argues with that, great. You've just admitted the Brexit is a disaster. Why isn't and he doing that? Is there is it the people around him? I, I think that's a wonderful idea. And I've mentioned it before. Go and meet the farmers. Get it filmed. Uh, sit down with them. Listen. Don't be. You don't even have to speak. Just listen to what they have to say. Say, OK, at the end of all of that, I'm going to try and fix it. If you vote for me, I'm going to try and fix it. Boris Johnson isn't isn't sitting down with you. He's not coming to visit you. He's not listening to your problems, especially the fishermen. You know, mm -hmm. was it uh, June Mummery who was talking about how, you know, we've been abandoned. She's a Brexiteer. She still thinks Brexit was a good idea. Imagine meeting with her and saying, OK, let's try and fix it then. Let, tell me what the problems are. But uh, don't know if I'd meet with her, Matt. No, yeah, no. She's, yeah, she's, she's not <laughs> she's, the one. I think I she's a lost cause. <laughs> she's blocked me now. She's I one, been. She blocked me as well. She's one of those people that just thinks that it, we've not done Brexit right or exactly. blames the EU or they, there is still some unicorn version of Brexit that will fix this. And yeah, she's Maybe still, then go to her constituency, just... but not to her exactly. or her area. Sorry. <laughs> there's, a, there's an interesting problem that I'm not seeing in the news at the moment, but also interestingly, I know this was brought up to Keir Starmer and I meet him which is that we're allowing imports in without checks at the moment. Is everyone aware of that? So yes. especially with food, because, and even Jacob Rees-Mogg has said, no, 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 we need to allow this all in because we put in checks. Most food only has a three-day yeah. expiration. Yeah. And as a result of that, we can't have these checks. Now, and that's 50% of our food. However, uh, the person I spoke to pointed out that there are two problems with this, and it revolves around WTO, who are going to eventually step in and go, you cannot continue to have food coming in and other imports coming in from the EU without checks and not do that with the rest of the world. I feel like Go just ahead. quickly, what, what that translates to, I think people need to know what that means because I think we don't talk about it in like, like make it relevant. What that means is if you've got some rogue farmer in France that's got a load of like shitty chickens who are, I don't know, just want the what, and he can't sell them within the EU because of the regulations, where's he going to send them? Straight to your dinner plate. Mm -hmm. Or fair, like most, some meatballs most... with some horse in it. Mm. Was it yeah, that? France. Yeah. <laughs> I um, I uh, I'm definitely aware from some of the. I know some of the people that run uh, wineries in France, and uh, they definitely do not send us their best grade stuff. But also, do you know what we're doing there? We are. It means we are literally giving EU exporters into Britain a competitive advantage again over mm -hmm. us, which we can't do under WTO rules which means eventually they're going to come in and they're going to go, you've got two choices. Either you have the same thing for the entire world or you put in regulations like you do for the entire world. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have an even bigger problem when that comes in. So we've also got another issue within that because if you put those barriers up, then we're going to have to start producing stuff inside this country. So one of the things I said, I've always said that the Brexit, uh, the Brexit government, the Conservatives have all, should have been doing, and we should be doing in Europe in general, is producing our own microchips and hard drives, which we don't. The majority of it comes over from China. The problem is we don't have the infrastructure for that. But imagine if we had to do that with every single mechanical device to regulate our own self-contained economy. We're not going to do it because we don't have the facility and the capacity for that. So then we go for the Patrick Minford thing 
And that's, there's an interesting thing within that. The rich, posh boy Brexiteers want free trade. The rest of the Brexiteers want a protectionism. And you've got a clash happening between the two, which is not being resolved and is also not being discussed. It's, it's a joke. And it's all because we've got a bunch of rich people telling us, little people, what we should think, do and act. You've even got places like in Penny Morden's constituency, I think Portsmouth, they've, they've spent millions erecting um, checks, like <laughs> infrastructure to actually deal with the checks that have now been postponed. So they are suing, allegedly, again, suing the government. No, yeah, no. I've got that. I've got that um, open. I've been, been waiting to do a, do a, a post about that. It's insane. Mm. Ironies about Brexit, just left, right and centre. It's the refusal to control our borders. It's prior. It's giving... French farmers' advantages over British farmers. It's insane. Welcome to the Brexit, sir. I'm sorry. We're in an interesting and sticky situation. And unfortunately, we're at the end of the program. So we're all going to have to say goodbye for now.